Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, a lecture on uh, Chapter 6 of Web. It has to do with the motor system for motor speech control. That's where we're going. And uh, that will complete our two-week review of um, uh, sensory systems and motor systems. And then we just need to plug in a few more details on uh, cranial nerves next week and we'll be ready to start examining cranial nerves and examining and testing motor speech and aphasia and language and cognitive disorders and uh, you should be able to by the time we practiced a little bit be able to uh, minimally identify when you have a patient who has a single lesion that explains everything uh, you know a lot of times patients will have had multiple strokes or they have a stroke and they have pre-existing Parkinson's disease. Uh, they have other things. In other words, they certainly could have more than one part of the neurological system that is damaged. Uh, and they could have some signs and symptoms, of course, that are sort of mixed then. But oftentimes you'll have patients who were fine up until the time they were admitted to the hospital with a new onset of something such as a stroke. And you want to be able to identify that everything is caused by the, the, a, a single thing. Uh, otherwise, it would change your prognosis and pro possibly your treatment plan. So that's kind of why we're where we're going. And I am going to bring up the slides uh, and share those at this time. And here they are. Okay, and I'm going to make that picture big. So uh, chapter six, it's from Webb. Uh, I do think all of the illustrations come right out of chapter six. The, the illustrations I have in the slides here except for one, I believe I got uh, one off of uh, Wikipedia, which is, by the way, is a wonderful resource. Uh, and although various people contribute to Wikipedia, it's not like a peer reviewed journal uh, or something like that, but it uh, tends to be highly actor accurate. I, I, I go to it all the time. So uh, anyway, let's, let's go through these slides. Uh, first of all, I want to start with a uh, a reminder, I think it's a reminder for you, of the difference between an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Uh, an upper motor neuron is, is a motor neuron, that is, it's going to provide some kind of input into movement or uh, uh, control posture or uh, 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 muscle tone or something like that, something to do with motor function. And uh, it is, um, it, it's something that's above the lower motor neuron, which the lower motor neuron is that neuron which goes right out to the muscle. It synapses on the muscle, whether it's, we're talking about a muscle of the head or neck region or the muscle of the body. The lower motor neuron is also called the final common pathway because it integrates information from an, a number of different upper motor neuron types uh, that originate in different parts of the brain and integrates that information in order to result in the movement. Uh, and one more name for that, I'm skipping down to the bottom uh, for a lower motor neuron, is an alpha motor neuron. That's the final common pathway. And then there's such a thing as a gamma motor neuron, which is a lower motor neuron. Uh, and we're not going to go into much detail on that. Um, sort of just jumping ahead to, to let you know where I'm trying to go with this. And I'm sorry it took so long to get this lecture done. I really pared it down a lot, and I pared it down with this in mind. I just wanted to give the amount of information that I think you need to actually solve clinical problems. So, in other words, no fluff or extra information uh, that might, you know, just learning facts for the sake of facts. Uh, but going, returning back to uh, upper motor neurons, those are motor neurons that connect from cortical areas to lower uh, motor neurons that are found in the cranial nerves. You got lower motor neurons in the cranial nerves, not all of them but most of them, and spinal nerves. And uh, all right, then an uh, overview of two additional things that I think you probably know, uh, the pyramidal system and the extrapyramidal system. The pyramidal system is a system of upper motor neurons that provide input directly from the motor cortex to lower motor neurons or the alpha motor neurons for the purpose of generating voluntary movement. Whereas the extra uh, extra pyramidal system is a system of upper motor neurons. That part of the definition is the same, but it provides input indirectly from the motor cortex to other lower motor neurons, mainly the gamma motor neurons, and I'm not going to go into details, uh, for the purpose of regulating reflexes, muscle tone, and posture. 
And when I say I'm not going to go into detail, it's not that I'm not going to mention it at all. I'm not going to look at the actual pathways uh, for the extrapyramidal system, you know, where they cross and that sort of thing. I'm going to give you the names of them and uh, so that you, you know about them, you know what the functions are. But I think I can simplify the interpretation of clinical signs without going into the pathways of the extrapyramidal system, which are quite complex. And I did have those slides in here, and I ended up taking almost all of them out, including all of them that showed pathways. <clears throat> all right. Um, so we're going to be looking at motor tracks and pathways. Uh, these are all upper motor neuron pathways that I show on this particular slide. Uh, the two categories of motor pathways are, again, the pyramidal system, which controls voluntary movement, uh, and the extrapyramidal system, which uh, controls muscle tone, reflexes, and posture. But uh, a little bit of embellishment here, Rick, looking at the uh, pyramidal system, it does consist of... Um, a, a, we can break it down a little bit more and give more names. One of them, one of the pyramidal system, one part of the pyramidal system is the cortical spinal tract. Now, the what it connects up is shown in the name. It goes from the cortex, where in the cortex, the motor strip, down to uh, the spinal level, down to the spinal cord. And where's, what's it going to do down there? It's going to synapse on a lower motor neuron or alpha motor neuron. But we can take that cortical spinal tract and divide it into two at the level of the cord. In other words, that cortical spinal tract descends as one tract on each side, all the way down to the very bottom of the medulla, what, what we'll call the caudal medulla. And at that point, 80% of the neurons in the cortical spinal tract Decacy. They cross to the other side. And the tract that is formed after, uh, below, I shouldn't say, I said after, <laughs> wrong, uh, below um, that decussation is referred to as the lateral cortical spinal tract. So where do you find that tract? In the spinal cord. And I'll show you two in a, in a cross section in just a moment. And then 20% of those cortical spinal neurons do not decussate. They just continue right on down in uh, the second one here, the medial cortical spinal tract. Okay, so cortical spinal tract starts in the motor strip and it's going to go all the way down to some different, one of the different levels, uh, all 31 segmental levels, each one corresponding to a spinal nerve. It's going to go down there and those neurons are going to then synapse on some alpha motor neuron. Um, some of them are crossed and some of them are not. Okay, then going to this one, there's a cortical bulbar tract, which I, oops, so, excuse me, which I think of as a companion. I mean, when you, it's, 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 it's within the brainstem, those neurons are together with the cortical spinal tract neurons. And what's it called? It's just called the, it's just called the, um, um, the cortical spinal tract. But um, the, the cortical bulbar are, in there too. So cortical ball bar contain neurons that do exactly the same thing as what we've just been talking about, except they don't go down to the spinal cord. They are shorter and they only go down to synapse on an alpha motor neuron that's gonna synapse, that's going to innervate something that we're gonna talk about as SLPs. In other words, they go down to a motor nucleus of a cranial nerve. It could be the 12th cranial nerve, it could be the fifth, uh, any of the cranial nerves that have a motor component. Uh, that's the cortical bulbar tract. It innervates cranial nerve motor nuclei. All right, then the extrapyramidal system controls muscle tone, reflexes, and posture. It too has a point of origin in the motor strip, but it's a little more complex. I mean, it synapses with things in the brainstem and then it sends down uh, tracks with different names and there are basically four of them. There might be one other, but I think that these are by far the main, main ones. The medial reticulospinal tract, the lateral reticulospinal tract, the rubrospinal, and the tectospinal. I'm only going to embellish a little bit on the medial and the lateral reticulospinal tract because, sorry about that, because they have to do with the regulation of muscle tone and of the spinal reflexes. 
Um, but as I said, I'm not going to go into the actual circuitry or pathway of any of those extrapyramidal tracks. So, so far you just know the names and you know they're extrapyramidal tracks and that's good enough. All right, now returning to the cortical spinal tract because we're gonna go through that. Um, we're gonna go through that in a little bit of detail so that you will be able to relate site of lesion to uh, the actual signs and symptoms, which would basically be a muscular paralysis um, or paresis. Paresis is partial weakness, paralysis is total weakness. Um, so looking at the cor cortical spinal tract, it originates in the motor strip, as I said before, and then the first order neurons from the cortical spinal tract they, <clears throat> they're they just going to descend down. And remember, they've got to get all the way down to the spine at some level. So they descend all the way down through the internal capsule, the cerebral peduncles, which are sort of the, the connection between the cerebrum and the brainstem, uh, through the pons, part of the brainstem, and then through the medulla, which is the next most caudal part of the brainstem. And then at that point, it shows here 80% decasate. It does not show the 20% that don't, but I do have an illustration from Wikipedia, I think the next one, that will show that. Will show that. And then you can see that those, there's those neurons, which we refer to as first order neurons, because they're the first one in this pathway we're talking about, they come down to the spinal cord. And depending how far they're going down and what muscle they're destined to uh, cause to move, voluntarily, uh, they will leave their tract and uh, uh, these, these would be individuals or small groups of neurons, leave the tract and come over to the ventral horn of the spinal cord and synapse on what the alpha motor neuron or the final common pathway. Okay, so much for that one. Now here's the one I did get this from, from uh, Wikipedia because it shows down here is where the detail is. This is just a reiteration of I said, what I said, first order neurons starting in the motor strip, down through the internal capsule, down through the cerebral peduncles, the pons, the medulla, caudal medulla, 80% decasate. They're trying to show that by a little bit bigger shaded area here of red, and 20% uh, continue on down in the medial cortical spinal tract. All right, so that's not a, any new information, but it's a different depiction that shows this better. The other thing uh, that, that is shown here, but it's not labeled at all, and I will go into the, some detail on this. You see some of these uh, upper motor neurons, cortical spinal neurons, leaving their system and coming over here to cross at, up here in the brainstem. And those are neurons that are going to decus, that are destined to go to the, um, brainstem motor nuclei. So those would actually be cortical ball bar neurons. All right, so that's a little footnote. I'll, I'm gonna reiterate that and show it in different ways because it's kind of an important point for understanding um, uh, the nature of uh, weak muscular weaknesses in the facial and oral and pharyngeal area. Okay, this, this slide just shows uh, two things. It shows the location of each of the tracks we're talking about. Uh, the cortical, the lateral cortical spinal and the medial cortical spinal. Here is the lateral cortical spinal tract shown here on your left. And you can see it's somatotopically organized. Um, and uh, this is the medial. Now here they've la labeled it an anterior cortical spinal tract and, and it is anterior, but it's it's got two names basically. Uh, the medial, you can see it's just off the midline, you know, or the anterior cortical spinal tract, same thing. Lateral, as far as I know, is only called the lateral. Okay. Now, remember I said that uh, the this system we're talking about, the pyramidal tract system, uh, decasates at the caudal mandala, and that would be the, for the cortical spinal ones, the ones that are destined for all the way down. Uh, and 80% of them, 80% uh, of those neurons will decasate. But when you look at the, when you look at where the, what, what muscle group we're talking about, the pattern of decussation is different. And this is where, this is why I uh, put this graph in, which I wrote myself. And by the way, I made up these numbers. I know they're pretty close, but it's, it, it's, it, I'll explain the first one and compare it to this one. Now, this upper extremity is your, basically your arm. 
Uh, the reason it's not called arm <laughs> is because technically in anatomical terminology, the arm is really the forearm. So if you say arm to a anatomist, it's the forearm. We're not talking about the forearm. We're talking about the whole arm as we would use that word in everyday language. It's the upper extremity. Same thing for the lower extremity. The lower extremity, if you say the leg, that's the calf. So I'm using the proper anatomical terminology and I'm saying upper extremity and lower extremity. So just to try to get you into how this chart is working, uh, let's, let's compare those two. If you're, if you're talking about the point of origin of cortical spinal neurons, cortical spinal neurons that are going to alpha motor neurons that are gonna innervate the upper extremity, the decussation is actually a higher percentage. 85% of the neurons that are gonna to go to your upper extremity are decussated, they crossed. 15% came on down in the medial cortical spinal tract. Compared to the leg, so if you look at that leg, 75%, uh, a smaller percentage, uh, still the majority, but a smaller percentage of the upper motor neurons uh, decussate if, if they're destined for innervating the lower extremity. Higher, higher percent of decussation in the, for the upper extremity, lower for the uh, lower extremity. Now, what's, what's, what's the implication of that? What that means is if you have a, um, an area of damage of the upper motor uh, neuron system, the cortical spinal neuron system, and typically, I mean, the patients we need, usually see would have had a big stroke up here that involved the motor strip. And usually it's the middle cerebral artery that has stroked out and they've got, they've got a stroke, which is gonna somehow affect a large part of the body. But it's not going to affect, it's not going to cause quite as much weakness in the lower extremity as in the upper extremity. And you'll see that in your patients. When you go in and see them after a brand new, often it might be a left hemisphere stroke, they have, they might not be able to move their upper extremity at all. But their lower extremity, if you ask them just to raise their knee, so they're 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 just going to bring their knee up off the bed a little bit, they are um they're moving at the hip joint versus you want to see, can they move the, can they move the arm? Can they move at the shoulder joint? Oftentimes they can't do it at all. It's just like that arm is dead. And then if you compare within the upper extremity, if you compare the amount of weakness in the hand and the forearm, that's going to be the weakest. That's what it's 95% crossed. And so they don't have, they only have 5% left from that ipsilateral uncrossed pathway. Those upper motor neurons do get down there because they originated in the side away from the damage. Now that might seem like a tricky concept, but once you get it, then these numbers click and make total sense. Um, so you'll, now how are you gonna see that? So you go to that same patient and you, ask them to move their arm, they might be able to move the, at the shoulder joint just a little bit. In other words, they can raise it. But then when you get down here to say, okay, can you take, can you raise your hand? Can't do it at all because there's greater weakness here than here. Why? Because a larger percentage of the, of the cortical spinal neurons, 95% originated in the damaged area and they're only getting 5% of the original innervation to those muscles. How did they get it from the, from the uncrossed pathway? Okay, so now, now that you've got that pattern, 85, higher for the hand and the forearm, a little better for the, up, a little less decussated for the upper arm and shoulder. And then same pattern for, for the lower extremity, 75% overall, foot and calf, a higher percentage, thigh and hip, a little lower percentage. So it's gonna, it, you're gonna see the, that pattern very often. Then when you look at the pattern of recovery, <clears throat> it goes in that order. In other words, they might have, they might have uh, total inability to uh, do this, move at the wrist or, or to move their fingers because the, those, those upper motor neuron or cortical spinal neurons are almost all crossed. Uh, so they're really paralyzed. But as the function returns, they'll, they'll uh, start to be able to move here first better, 
here, second at the elbow, and here's gonna be the last to return, if it returns, and it may not. Uh, same pattern here. So they're going to, you're gonna see better return in the lower extremity than the upper extremity, and then a better return within those extremities, the closer you are to the body, is basically. All right, so we're down here to 65. Let's go here another step. Um, okay, so now we're gonna, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna lump in a bunch of muscles that don't seem to be very related, but you'll see how they are related. The torso, which is basically your body, not the limbs, and the neck, and the upper one third of the face. Also the pharynx, and the larynx and the extraocular muscles. We're not actually going to test those, but it is just a fact that they are in the same group of muscles. Now, what, what is it that unites these group of muscles in a way? It's that those muscles are innervated uh, basically bilaterally. They get equal input from an uncrossed group of fibers and a cross group of fibers. Or the, another way to say it is they get equal input from the two from the two sides of the cortex. So what will happen, let's say that again, let's go to our left hemisphere stroke involving the middle cerebral artery. And you see that they have a right hemiparesis. And then you get to the here and they're sitting upright. They can sit upright. Why? Why aren't they going like this? Or I guess it'd be like this to the right because um, both sides of the both sides of the torso are getting input from the good side of the brain and 50%. So are they weak? Yeah, a little weak because they're 50% weakened on both sides, but it's an it's a um, bilaterally symmetrical weakness. Uh, and typically, if you're in halfway decent shape, you don't need 100% of your weakness simply to sit upright in a chair. Does that make sense? Uh, you, you can be 50% stronger or weaker and still sit upright. Um, and then this, we'll see the same thing with the face. Now, how does that look, look in the face? I, I keep jumping and I don't mean to do that. Sorry. Okay. Um, when you look at their face, just at rest, the forehead and the eyes look symmetrical. And then you, if you ask them to raise their eyebrows, they go up symmetrically. Uh, if you ask them to close their eyes tightly, they close them symmetrically. Uh, now the pharynx, you can't really see it very well, and the larynx, you can. But if we were to do a modified barium swallow and look at the barium that's left over in the pharynx after the swallow, uh, this kind of patient we're talking about who has a unilateral hemiparesis will typically show some evidence of weakness on both sides of the pharynx. And the way that shows up is that they, they swallow and they've got some barium left behind. It can be a little bit or a lot, depending how weak they are, but it's not unilateral. In other words, they've got the uni they've got the right side hemiparesis, but they don't have the right side weakness of the pharynx. So they have a bilateral weakness of the pharynx. Uh, same for the extraocular muscles, which move the eyes around. If you just look at their eyes, their eyes are moving uh, in coordination with each other and uh, they're all aligned and everything. Uh, then jumping down here, Let's go here. Uh, tongue and lower two thirds of the face. What brings those together? The cortical, those would be cortical ball bar, the cortical ball bar neurons that originated in the motor strip decussate about 80%. 20% don't decussate, 20%, 80% decussate. And so if you look at the lower two thirds of this same patient we're talking about, the lower two thirds of the opposite side from the lesion are drooping at rest. And then you ask them to smile, retract the lips, and they have diminished, it could be even absent retraction on that affected side. If the stroke is on the left side, the uh, diminished retraction would be on the right side and they'd have the right hemicresis. You, you see, I'm kind of building a pattern that you're gonna see again and again and again. And once in a while you're gonna walk in and patient doesn't fit the pattern. And then that's when you start looking for something else that's going on because there's undoubtedly a, 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 a something different from this stroke we're talking about now. The tongue, the tongue's gonna show a unilateral weakness on the side opposite the, opposite the lesion. Uh, how does it show itself? It shows it when they um, protrude the tongue. 
So they protrude the tongue and the tongue deviates to the weak side. Why is that? The genial glosses is the muscle that is pulling your tongue out. And you shape it with the intrinsic muscles, but you pull it out to protrude it with the genial glosses muscle. And if you have a weakness on one side, it's kind of kind of go to that side of the weakness. And so you see deviation of the um, tongue to the side of the weakness. And for this patient who has a left lesion, probably has an aphasia, uh, they have the right hemiparesis, they have the right lower facial droop, diminished lip retraction on the right, and then you ask them to protrude their tongue, it deviates to the right. Okay, so you see all these different numbers depending upon what part of the body we're talking about. But overall, if you're just thinking about cortical spinal neurons that originated in the motor strip, 80% of them decussate. Whew, that's a lot of information, but once it kind of clicks, this, this says it all. And by the way, don't bother memorizing these numbers because they are not, uh, and I don't believe anybody's actually counted them, but it's, I mean, it is factual in the sense that it's showing the pattern. All right. <clears throat> now we're talking about the same phenomenon here and just embellishing a little bit from what I just said here, because notice I was talking about some cranial nerves, which you talk about pharynx and face and extraocular muscles and tongue, uh, that's cranial nerves. So going to this one, this shows, uh, this shows the cranial nerves at kind of united together with the... Uh, uh, with the um, um, system we just finished, which is the cortical spinal. So here, here's the motor cortex. Here's a heavy black line, which they're showing decussates across the midline and forms a lateral cortical spinal tract. Here is a dotted line that does not decussate at the caudal medulla, but just continues on down as the anterior or medial cortical spinal tract. And then here are the different cranial nerve nuclei. Three, three four, and six, extraocular muscles. Um, five and seven, and nine, 10, 11, and 12. What they're trying to show here is that the decussation that occurs in the cortical bulbar neurons, or cortical nuclear also, same thing. I haven't used that word before, but cortical nuclear is in our book a lot. Um, that, that, those neurons decussate at the level wherever the motor nucleus is, where they're going to go. So number three, the ocular motor, um, ocular motor nucleus, is it actually in the midbrain. So these fibers represented by the green decussate there. Uh, it doesn't show it very well here, but there is a nucleus on this side too, and that's innervated by uh, some by, by, by these neurons that don't get decussate. In other words, these receive 50% of their innervation through this cross path, the cross pathway they're trying to show, and 50% from the pathway that's descending and doesn't cross. Hope that makes sense. We'll talk more about it in class as needed. Um, then for five and seven, this uh, we'll have to elaborate with another slide on this, but they're showing a cross pathway. The key thing that I think this illustration shows is that th these crossings occur at the level of these nuclei. These particular nuclei, the, mo the uh, trigeminal motor nucleus and the facial nucleus are in the pods. So these, these cortical bulbar neurons that are decussating do so at that level. Unlike cortical spinal, they all decussate, well, 80% of them anyway, at the caudal medulla. The cortical bulbar neurons decussate at the level of their, their destination, wherever they're headed for, what, whatever nucleus with the alpha, that contains the alpha motor neurons they're going to synapse on. And then here, same thing, 9, 10, 11, and 12, they're showing that the decussations occur at that level. It's down in the medulla. So medulla, um, midbrain, and pons. All right, I think that this just puts it into words. The cortical bulbar tract is a companion tract to the cortical spinal, but the neurons synapse are lower motor neurons in these cranial nerves. Notice I don't have all the cranial nerves because not all the cranial nerves have uh, somatic muscle, um, I should say striated muscles that will get, uh, get innervated by this system we're talking about. Uh, and the neurons leave the tract at each of the several levels 
I've left out a word here, where there are motor nuclei. Um, I don't know if you all know about branchial efferent and somatic efferent. I make a reference to, to it here in case you are aware of them. This is where it would fit in. At this point, I don't see that we have to go into any detail. When we look next week at cranial nerves, I will bring that up a little and, and embellish on that. Um, okay, so now we're going to look at the different patterns of decussation for these cortical ball bar neurons in the next slide. And it should, these three slides, the previous one, this one, and the next one, all kind of fit together and show, I, I would say, similar information in a little bit different way. Okay, so here again, these are the cranial nerves we're talking about. I left out three, four, and six because we're not really going to test them but uh, you know about them, it's a bilateral innervation. I could have added another line and put three, four, and six, bilateral innervation. So what that means when we put bilateral innervation is that the uh, lower motor neurons receive 50% of their input from the crossed pathway that originated in the opposite uh, motor cortex and 50% from the uncrossed pathway that originated in the ipsilateral motor cortex. All right, as, by the way, just as a reminder, more detail next week, uh, quite a bit more detail on this, but what does the trigeminal uh, nerve innervate as far as uh, striated muscles? The chewing muscles. So that tells us something about uh, the typical kind of a phasic patient we'll see who has the left hemisphere stroke and the right hemiparesis and the right lower two thirds of the face drooping and the tongue deviating to the right. But you look at their chewing muscles, we can test it in various ways. They're functional. They are, they are not asymmetrical in their function. Are they weak? They're, they are weaker, but the point is they're, you don't need 100% of your strength simply to chew. Um, so they're, they're functional. Uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, facial nerve, next one. That's mixed bilateral and contralateral innervation. Uh, bilateral for the upper third, contralateral for the lower third, two thirds, I should say. Uh, glossopharyngeal and, and um, TIM, both bilateral. One little proviso on the glossopharyngeal, it only innervates one muscle, that's it. It has a lot of sensory functions going, but only one muscle, and that's the stylopharyngeus. So from a clinical perspective, I guess I probably won't bring that one up again because I'm not make reference to it next week, but we don't, we can't test the stylopharyngeus. There's no clinical way to, using your traditional examination methods to test that muscle. So we don't really worry about it. Um, <clears throat> the vagus nerve, on the other hand, we, we, we're a little more concerned about that because it's, it's a lot of muscles. It's all your constrictor muscles in the pharynx and it's all your intrinsic laryngeal muscles get innervated by that vagus nerve. The vagus nerve, by the way, does have other functions. We'll review those. But as far as muscular function or the striated muscular function, uh, it's a bilateral innervation pattern, with meaning both sides of those structures receive 50% of their input from the opposite and 50% from the ipsilateral motor cortex. There is a significant... Um, life preserving function let's say to that pattern for those muscles if you have a profound weakness on one side of the larynx especially you won't be able to close the larynx which means you won't be able to uh, prevent aspiration during swallowing which means you probably will die so the system has kind of developed itself in a way that allows one half of the brain to be damaged at the cerebral level especially and you still can swallow, probably not perfectly, by the way, but a function, uh, somewhat safely. Um, spinal accessory is contralateral. And we're not actually going to do testing for the uh, spinal accessory. I mean, uh, it's it's got a kind of a complex uh, circuitry. And uh, the way we could test it is by uh, turning the head against res resistance when you, and by doing that you're testing the sternomastoid or elevating the shoulder against resistance uh, and you're, you're testing um, the, the muscles up here. But as SLPs, I don't, I used to test it actually, I was trained to test it, but I, I figured out that it was not making any difference in my patient care. So I ended up not testing it because 
if you're seeing people in a hospital, oftentimes they're very sick and they don't have much endurance. And so you, you can't test a lot of things just because you know how to. Uh, and then the hypoglossal is, it is primarily bilateral, but uh, the, I think of it as a, as a contralateral pattern of innervation because the way we test it, I mean, the most, um, let's say, obvious test is tongue protrusion. And that genioglossus is contralaterally innervated by the cortical bulbar neurons, most of them across. So they're gonna show that weakness. The intrinsic muscles are more bilaterally innervated. So uh, the tongue is not gonna be completely paralyzed on one side, but it will definitely show its weakness if you have an upper motor neuron lesion um, in, in the manner that we're talking about. Hopefully this is beginning to click. I know you're gonna have to come back on that. And I'm, I guess I'm glad we're recording it so that you have a chance to think about it a little bit and then we'll study it in the classroom and I'm gonna give you a bunch of problems to solve. And by the time you can solve those problems, you understand that material. All right, a little more detail on the facial. Uh, what this shows is it shows Fibers up here, which would be cortical ball bar. How, how do I know that? Because they're destined for lower motor neurons that are going to the face. That would be, what, what cranial nerve are we talking about? Seven, it's cranial nerve. So they are not going down to this. These neurons are not going down to the spine at all. They're right next to the cortical spinal, but those are the cortical ball bar. And what they're trying to show now with these pattern of solid lines coming from one side and dotted lines coming from the other side is how, um, let, let's see, here's a facial nerve. And they're trying to show that uh, the forehead gets from both sides, but the lower two thirds gets primarily from the opposite side of the lesion, uh, opposite side of the brain, I should say. Sorry about that. All right, so that's, that's what they're trying to show here. Is this one is crossed. Um, this one is crossed. The ones coming up here to the forehead are uh, un uncrossed. Okay. All right, that gets us through cortical spinal and cortical ball bar. And I do believe it gets us through the pathways that we're gonna be looking in, in uh, detail. Uh, what I'm gonna look at now is the extrapyramidal system. And this is, this is more at a, um, I guess a descriptive level without quite the precision. The reason for that is we could spend a couple hours probably talking about the extrapyramidal circuitry and the actual pathways and everything and the stretch reflex, which um, I hope I hope you studied a little bit in uh, 474 or your neurology course at the undergraduate level. But I can boil it down to something really easy. If you're talking about damage to lower motor neurons, there's gonna be a certain pattern of weakness, which we refer to as flaccid paresis, weakness, or flaccid paralysis. The, the, the implications of the word flaccid mean that there is um, uh, no information getting through. I mean, they can be totally, totally limp. It's got no muscle tone, whereas with spastic, there's gonna be not only muscle tone, but higher than usual muscle tone. So that's a lower motor neuron lesion. Whereas with an upper motor neuron lesion, it's gonna be spastic. So flaccid, lower motor neuron, spastic, upper motor neuron. And basically that's enough circuitry because you know what upper motor neurons are. If they're upper motor, upper motor neurons in the, um, there, there's going to be spasticity. Okay, now what are these? Uh, they are, what are the, extrapyramidal systems. The cortical reticular tract starts in the motor strip, goes down to the reticular formation in the pons and the medulla. So the um, it originates in the motor strip and other areas of cortex, and it generates EPSPs in neurons in the pons and the medulla. All right, now that's one, cortical reticular, just from the cortex down to the uh, brainstem, basically, two parts of the brainstem. Then the lateral reticulospinal tract takes off from one of those. It participates in the generation of the muscle tone and stretch reflex. It originates in the medullary reticular formation, 
and it generates IPSPs on the gamma motor neuron. Um, now we could work on this a little harder, or I could just take those things out. I don't think I'd be asking you questions on it because uh, I'm just actually just wanting you to know what the extrapyramidal systems are, what the names of them are. And um, so th these are the names cortical reticular, lateral reticulospinal, which basically has a, an effect of uh, decreasing muscle tone if you put activity into it. Uh, medial reticulospinal tract basically has an effect of increasing muscle tone if you put activity into it. Okay, and then not quite done with extrapyramidal. Vestibulospinal tract uh, facilitates reflex activity and spinal mechanisms for controlling muscle tone for body position. Um, the, the implications of this track is it, it's gonna, it has circuitry that allows you to correct your body position in a reflexive way. If you start to fall, sensory information obviously has to go up to your brain to tell you I'm falling and you do something about it. But it doesn't go, it does go up to the cortex and you will feel that you're falling. But before you ever feel it, it will already start to correct yourself. Your arms will already start to come out and you do whatever you can to break that fall through things that are going on in this system. Your, your vestibular system is picking it up and you're starting to correct it before you process it up here. That's the purpose of this. Um, rubrospinal transmits coordinated input from the cerebellum uh, to lower motor neurons. So again, this has to do with coordination and it pushes the task of coordinating the a contraction of various muscles to accomplish a smooth movement without it all having to go up here. Is it is information going to go up here so you can feel? Yes. But before that happens, you will already be having smooth muscles. Um, so basically, that's the, the what we're going to do on the extrapyramidal system. Um, all right, I want to say a little bit more about the muscle tone and stretch reflex. It's required to understand upper motor neuron, um, neuron injury results in spasticity, which I mentioned. Um, would, if there's upper motor neuron injury, uh, there's probably going to be weakness, almost certainly going to be weakness. And uh, it's going to be referred to as spastic weakness or spastic paralysis if it's total. And spastic paresis if it's a partial weakness. In spasticity, there is elevated muscle tone. That means the muscles are tight. And if you look at the pattern of spasticity uh, of a typical stroke patient that we'll see so many of, you'll see that uh, after they've had a chance to kind of stabilize, their muscles will become more and more uh, spastic for a few weeks. And they're very typically going to have this particular thing that I'm trying to show you they, they're flexed here at the elbow, they're flexed at the wrist, and their fingers are flexed. So those muscles, it's not that they're doing work that's useful. Uh, they probably can't pick up a glass of water, but the muscles are tight. That is the elevated muscle tone. And there, it's a particular pattern of tightness, depending upon where in the system the upper motor neurons are damaged. We're just gonna see so many people with cerebral strokes. Uh, not the only ones we'll see, but many. Uh, and they'll they'll have this very typical pattern. Uh, it's so the, the spasticity can be so tight that their fingernails actually cut into their hands. The part of nursing care is to keep those fingernails clipped, or sometimes to put something into the into the hand. Uh, it looks like kind of a like a roll of fabric, or like a look, kind of like a toilet paper roll, smaller though, in in there to keep those fingers from doing the damage that they can do. And um, they will be very, very tight. Now they give them medications to reduce that a little bit and physical therapists and occupational therapists also do exercises to help loosen that up a little bit. But that is a, uh, th that's the elevated muscle tone and it's all over their body uh, for the parts that are weak. So, it's, so if, you were if you're talking about a left hemisphere uh, stroke that reduces results in a right hemiparesis, the spasticity will be on the right they won't have any problem on the left. And they'll also have this thing called a hyperactive stretch reflex, which means if the, if the neurologist just taps the muscle in a certain area, uh, they will, uh, they'll, they'll have a hyperactive, excessive reflex. 
uh, a really typical test is done, and you know about it, would be the the knee the knee tap, the knee jerk test, where they tap the uh, tap the patellar muscle and the the leg extends in a reflexive movement. All right, lower motor neuron injury on the other on the other hand results in flaccidity or a flaccid paralysis if it's total or a flaccid paresis. In flaccidity, there's reduced muscle tone, a hypoactive reflex, and then one other thing happens, there's muscle atrophy. There's something about that having a, uh, I'll call it a patent or a useful, actually connected up um, lower motor neuron to the muscle, which keeps the muscle, uh, even though it may not be able to move, it, 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 it is able to um, maintain its bulk better. Now it will get some atrophy, but it, it'll maintain its bulk better. So there, there's noticeable muscle atrophy with lower motor neuron lesions. All right, now this is a key slide because you know, I told you I'm not gonna go into the circuitry of all that that results in it. And we're not gonna go back up to the, the pontine and the medullary reticular formation and the medial and the lateral reticular and show all this and the stretch reflex to come down to the muscle and show all of that. We're not gonna do it because this is really all you need. If the lower motor neuron is damaged, there's gonna be a flaccidity. If the upper motor neuron system is damaged, there's gonna be weakness and it's gonna be spastic weakness or paralysis, depending how complete it is. Okay, uh, now I wanna just say, I'm not gonna show the circuitry of the uh, stretch reflex, but I wanna tell you kind of what it's for. What, 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 why all this fuss about the stretch reflex? Um, so here's the deal. Your cortical spinal and cortical bulbar neurons carry messages down to the muscles or the lower motor neurons that go to the muscles to tell them what, uh, what the target movement is. Maybe the target movement is this, to bring up a glass of water to my lips. So I, I have to go through these different points in space to get up here. What, it, what that system that, that cortical spinal or cortical ball bar system does not do is tell exactly how much muscle contraction is needed. It just gives the targets. I want you to come from here to here, okay? Uh, then what happens is that you have to put force into the muscular, muscular contraction, depending upon whether you're picking up a feather to bring it to here, a glass of water to bring it to here, or a brick to bring it here, you see? I hope that I hope that illustration makes sense. It's going to take a different force depending upon the specific circumstances of the task. The cortical spinal just tells the target movements that are going to be needed. And then the stretch reflex is a, actually um, generates the amount of force that's needed. How does it do it? Down at the level of the muscle and scattered all through the muscle, every muscle in our body, every striated muscle in our body, are little detectors that can detect stretch. So if you're trying to bring your muscle, your hand to here, but the brick is keeping it down here, th those muscles are going to be stretched and they will signal in just a two neuron chain that goes to the spinal cord and back down to the alpha motor neuron. Hey, we need a little more. Okay. So that's that's what the stretch reflex does for us in everyday life. Uh, it pushes down to the reflex level some of the demands of every movement that we make, including down here, see, speaking. Uh, depending upon the core, articula core articulatory demands of the particular phonetic uh, construction we're trying to speak, uh, you have to have different amounts of contraction. So your Broca's area and motor strip right behind it are going to tell the articulators where they want them to be. And then the amount of actual force, we're talking about small increments here, uh, would be different depending upon the core articulatory demands of the task. And that's what the stretch reflex does. It participates in every single movement we make. Uh, we never contract anything without our stretch reflex being involved. And that's why we have it. Uh, so, Otherwise, would there be another way to do it? I guess so, I don't really know, but it would take a lot more demands up here in order to be able to generate precisely the amount of contraction that is needed for the particular task. And our system is constructed so that that, that precision comes from a lower reflexive level uh, called the stretch reflex. All right. 
this is a kind of a reiteration of what I've already said. Uh, I, it's a generation of muscle tone and the stretch reflex. The muscle tone comes from that same system, uh, from a balance between the two parts of the reticular formation that keep the tone just like it's supposed to be. Uh, and it, your muscle tone does differ depending upon the part of the body that's involved. For example, your upper extremities don't have as much. Your torso has more. And that is so that just the muscle tone itself will tend to keep you upright. So we don't have to be doing a whole lot of activity up here in the motor, motor strip just to keep our torso upright. So I have more muscle tone in my torso, less in the upper extremity, if that, if that makes sense. So it's, it's a little more kind of a complex pattern if you look into the brainstem and say, what, what exactly is going on with this muscle tone? It's, it's keeping our muscles tense at the right level, depending upon the particular circumstances of what those muscles do, like torso versus extremity, or, and depending upon the demands of the particular task, like picking up the brick or picking up the feather. Um, the stretch reflex, I know we've used that term, it's also got two other names which your book uses. One of them, I can't remember which, myotactic. I think it uses myo myotatic. And uh, I thought, myotatic, I don't, that's spelled wrong. And I looked it up. It's not spelled wrong. It's, it is another, it's another way to say the same thing. Uh, so myotactic, myo, my, myotactic, myotatic, and stretch reflex, three different ways to say the same thing. And what is it? It's a muscle contraction in response to stretching within the muscle. Um, and it is a monosynaptic reflex, which means just one synapse in that reflex, uh, two neurons, one sensory that comes back from the uh, muscle spindle, it's called, that's the little, what I called earlier, the detector, and, and, and then the alpha motor neuron that goes back to it. That's a two neuron chain. And so that, that allows it to be very fast in response to external loads placed on the muscle. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry. I wish I didn't do that. Um, so you, you get, you get the precise movement that is needed for the particular load that's encountered in that movement. Okay, what does the myotactic uh, reflex accomplish in everyday situation? It's a reiteration, but put out here in words. It adjusts the amount of contractile force needed to accomplish the intended movement in the context of based on opposing forces such as weight. When you move anything, you're going to have some kind of opposing force. So it's a, it could be gravity. So it's always going to be something. And the adjustments for those external uh, sources uh, are made at the spinal cord or the reflexive level. So here's my little picking up the glass example. If you don't do it, if you if you pick up the glass like you're going to pick up the the uh, the brick, there's going to be quite a lot of spillage. So uh, do you know that by calculating? Boy, that's a glass. I think I better not apply much contractile force because it's not a brick. You don't do it like that. You're just going to pick up the glass and then your stretch reflex will correct as needed. Um, clinical effects on muscle tone generated by upper versus lower motor neuron injury. Um, I've kind of already said this, so this is a this is a duplication. I'm trying to point out the importance of this sort of simple way of thinking about it. And as clinicians, I think it, as SLP clinicians, I think it works really well for us. Injury to the lower motor neurons will result in weakness, flexibility, muscle atrophy. Injury to the upper motor neurons will result in weakness. Uh, again, some pattern of spasticity, depending upon exactly where the injury is, like up here versus midbrain versus lower, uh, versus spinal cord, the spinal cord, you, they'll get a pattern of spasticity too, but it looks different from the one in our typical cerebral stroke. And of course, there's, um, there's less muscle atrophy in the uh, upper motor neuron lesion than in the lower motor neuron, lower motor neuron lesion. I, will, I want to uh, kind of just remind of two things here. Where exactly could an injury be and cause damage to lower motor neurons? Well, certainly in the peripheral nerve. So if you come out to a, a nerve that goes to some muscles, the spinal nerve that goes to some muscles, and you cut the nerve, well, obviously you're going to be cutting the axons of the lower motor neurons. 
Uh, if you cut the ventral root, you're going to be cutting the axons of the lower motor neurons. But also, now I'm going to I'm going to bring this up to the to the facial nerve. The facial nerve has a nucleus. It's called the facial motor nucleus. It's in the pons. If you had a little stroke in the pons that damaged the right facial nucleus, you'd have the same pattern of total facial paralysis as if you snipped the facial nerve. So it's just a, a reminder that the nucleus is in the CNS, but a damage in the CNS that involves that facial nucleus will be knocking out the lower motor neurons. What is the nucleus? It's a collection of cell bodies. And so for the facial nucleus, it's a collection of cell bodies whose axons go out with the facial nerve. So by the time they get out to the, um, you know, past the brainstem, that's the peripheral nervous system. And you cut that, you get, you get, the, fa you get the facial weakness on the whole side. If you do that, you don't get that protection from the bilateral uh, pattern of innervation that we looked at in two or three slides. Uh, you, you, there's, no, there's, no, there's no neuron to go to those muscles. So you get a total facial weakness on the whole side of the face. It's actually called the Bell's palsy if you do it with the seventh cranial nerve. Okay, and we'll, we'll remind of that again and again because the implication is that um, if you have a brainstem stroke, it's very likely it will involve some facial, not facial, some cranial nerve motor nucleus, and you'll have those lower motor neuron signs ipsilaterally. And that same stroke has most likely damaged descending upper motor neurons. And so you'll have spasticity and spastic paresis or paralysis on the opposite side of the body. So you see somebody with a right total facial weakness and uh, a left hemiparesis with spasticity, flaccidity up here, spasticity the rest of the body on the opposite side. That can only mean one thing. That is a pontine lesion on the side of the facial weakness. On the, I think I said right. All right. So that's, that's the level. We don't have to go into all the circuitry to figure that out. Um, we're just seeing, we're just seeing these certain patterns that jump out at us and tell us, oh, that's brainstem, that's that's all upper motor neurons, that's cerebrum, whatever. We'll have lots of examples. Okay. Uh, other signs of upper motor neuron injuries, just to just to kind of um, uh, remind you now. As as far as I know, SLPs don't test these. Neurologists absolutely do. The, they're going to test for the Babinski. It's a, it's a stimulus to a strong scratching movement of the sole of the feet. If you want to see it, it's just about a two-minute video. I'm not going to play it now because you can play it if you want to. Um, uh, you don't have to because I think it's enough to know that the Babin Babinski sign goes along with spasticity, and it's part. It's a sign of upper motor neuron in injury. Uh, clonus, excuse me, <laughs> clonus is another kind of reflex that the neurologist will test, test for. And what they do is they, they take the foot and they just push all the toes up. And then what happens is the foot starts going like this by itself. So they push, push the toes up and then let it go. And the foot's going like this for a few seconds. And there's an example of that too. Again, it's just a couple of minutes. What is it? Uh, sign up, upper motor neuron injury. You're gonna see it in spasticity. Uh, okay, now a change of, uh, pace here. And again, we're not going to do circuitries. Uh, I want to just mention the basal ganglia. You probably know from 474 what they are. Those, they're deep nuclei within the cerebral, cerebral hemispheres. Um, it goes thalamus most centrally, internal capsule, which are those descending and ascending connections. Uh, we talked about the ascending sensory connections going through the internal capsule last week, and now the descending cortical spinal and cortical ball bar and uh, uh, um, uh, upper motor neuron uh, pyramidal system, excuse me, extra pyramidal systems too. Um, and then outside of that, the caudate nuclei, the caudate nuclei, the caudate nucleus, the putamen, the globus pallidus, all parts of the basal ganglia. 
And what do they do? Well, they, it's a, they accomplish a, a combination of inhibition and excitation uh, with other parts of the brain to coordinate movements, basically, and to keep them smooth. And you get a little bit of an inclination about what the basal ganglia do by looking at the disorders that evolve from damage in those areas. They're, they're movement disorders, basically, is what they're called. They're not paralyses or pareses. They're movement disorders. One is an akinesia, which there's a park a po poverty of movement, mean, meaning reduced. So uh, Parkinson's disease is a very, uh, very common um, disease that involves usually both sides of the brain, and there is a paucity of movement. There's if you just look at, for example, their papapas. We all would say pa 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 pa. But they they blur it with the very minimal movements. You see, I'm not moving my lips much at all. I'm not. I had don't have a normal excursion of the mandible and the lips. I'm going. Oh, it's out just that blurry. Uh, it, it's a paucity of movement. It's fast, but it's a paucity of movement. And then a dyskinesia involves um, uh, excessive uh, involuntary movements. They can be unilateral. And if they're unilateral, uh, it's typically caused by contralateral basal ganglia involvement. Um, and that does happen. It could happen with a stroke. It could happen with a tumor. Uh, many times these, um, the dyskinesias are caused by a more of a systemic thing. Like in the, in the case of the Parkinson's disease, it's a problem with dopamine. And so it's not that the structures themselves I'm not saying there's no damage there. I'm just saying if you look at a CT scan, uh, there's no big stroke or anything like that. The the uh, the uh, transmitter is system, but in the synapse is not working correctly, and but, so it's bilateral. Uh, and same thing for Huntington's chorea, typically bilateral, bilateral, and tardive dyskinesia, which is a movement disorder um, uh, as well. Okay, so these are the dyskinesias. Uh, Korea, the Koreas, uh, Huntington Korea is one of them, uh, involve quick, random, hyperkinetic movements. Uh, athetosis, which involves slow, irregular uh, writing and or writhing, I meant to say writhing, excuse me, there's an H missing there. Um, let me look at what slide that is so I can correct that. 22, 22, okay, sorry about that. Um, Myoclonus, which is a rough, brief, almost lightning-like contraction of a muscle. Uh, if, by the way, if you want to see these, just go to YouTube and put in myoclonus, and you see a bunch of them. Um, and uh, then facial and tardive dyskinesia. These are bizarre movements of the uh, face and tongue. And, and I've seen many of them, but fortunately, not so many in the last 20 years. Uh, they were very often caused as an adverse reaction to very the common, the most common antipsychotic drugs at that time, Thorazine and Milarel, you might have heard about them. But in 2005, I, I don't think they became absolutely outlawed, but it became a, a, a not best practices to give them because of these reactions that happened fairly often, not in the majority of cases, but fairly often, somebody can be going along on their Thorazine and hopefully getting the benefits uh, from it. And then they've been on it for a year. And then one day they they pretty rapidly develop um, a uh, tardive dis or focal point dyskinesia or facial dyskinesia, a dyskinesia that involves only the face. And so now those, those drugs were replaced in 2005 by newer drugs, by newer antipsychotic drugs. Seroquel is a common one which caused dyskinesia sometimes, but much less frequently. So that's why I can't say I did not ever see anyone after 2005, but I saw quite a few people. Um, what, and then what we do for them? Well, we, uh, first of all, just identified what the problem was in terms of their speech, uh, a hyperkinetic disor uh, dysarthria. And uh, typically the neurologist would, and psychiatrist would work to change the medication if they had the reaction on Thorazine, maybe they won't have it on Milarel, so they kind of like work work like that. Uh, and then the dyskinesia would often, but not always, go away. Uh, we could do some speech therapy, but basically you can't make the dyskinesia go away with speech therapy. You can help the patient to compensate is, is the extent of it. 
thin. We're almost there, by the way. Uh, cerebellum and cerebellar disorders. The role of the cerebellum is to uh, accomplish synergistic coordination of groups of muscles to execute movements smoothly. Um, the disorder that results from uh, cerebellar lesions or dysfunction is called ataxia. And it's a coordination problem. Ataxia is a coordination problem. It can be unilateral. If there's unilateral damage to the cerebellum, for example, a stroke, you can certainly have a stroke in the cerebellum. The ataxia is ipsilateral. I had some slides that go into the circuitry that will explain that, but I think it's enough just to know that uh, cerebellar lesions will cause an ataxia. And if it's a unilateral lesion, the ataxia will be ipsilateral to the lesion on the same side as the lesion. If it's a bilateral, uh, it will be a, the whole body. What, for example, is a common cause of a bilateral ataxia? Alcoholic encephalopathy, where somebody has drunk enough for a long enough period of time to kind of mix up their cerebellum. And it's not, not just on one side, it's both, it's, it's everything in the cerebellum and they get ataxia. And, and uh, I have an example, a two minute example here of ataxia of gait, mean, meaning of walking. And you can see why they look like drunk, really. And then I have here an example of unilateral ataxia. And you can see that, that the two tasks that are used to uh, identify a, a unilateral ataxia. If you were testing somebody who has bilateral ataxia using uh, the test for limb apraxia, you'd see they have it on all four, four limbs. They, uh, just, just as a simple one, they'll show you this if you look at the video. If you put your finger out here and then have the patient touch your finger and then their nose, and then again, their finger and their nose, and then the, and back and forth a few times, they will show that they, they're going like this uh, if they have a, a taxi. And if it's unilateral, they'll show it on one side, but not the other. Okay, a few more terms that have to do with cerebellar disorders. These are things that would be seen in somebody who has the ataxia. One is uh, dysmetria, the inability uh, to regulate distance, speed, and um, distance, speed, and movement. So that is slide um, 24, and I left out a word. So we'll go back and fix that before I post these in a few minutes. Um, okay, back, coming back here. Uh, adiodokinesia, the inability to perform rapid alternating movements of the tongue. Uh, I don't mean the tongue, rapid alternating movements. So if you, if you go to, we do it in speech by going pataka, 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 pataka. That's a diadokinetic test for speech production. And uh, so you're, it's alternating movements, it's rapid, and they have great coordination problems with that. They also have intention tremors, which are tremors that are present when they move. Uh, as opposed to people with Parkinson's disease, they have a resting tremor, whether you just look at their hands, they're just sitting there, and their, their hands are going like this. That's a resting tremor. An intention tremor is a tremor when you're moving. Uh, and then they'll have nystagmus, uh, which is an oscillatory movement of the eye. It can be in any direction. Uh, if you ever are stopped, as I told you about um, being stopped one time, it was scary, but because I had had a drink, one drink. Um, but I, but uh, the first test they do, they just look in your window and say, have you been drinking tonight, sir? And yes, uh, yes I had one drink. And then they say, well, you look at my finger and they go going like this and they, they, will, they will see the stagmus if you've been uh, drinking excessively. And it's a back, kind of a back and forth fluttering of the eyeball, not the eyelid, the eyeball, at the, at, especially at the ends of the movement. So you'll see it well illustrated if you look at that little one, uh, one minute uh, nystagmus. And then last but not least, a sign of a cerebellar disorder would be ataxic dysarthria. And we will learn to identify that in two weeks. Okay, last slide. Whew. I don't know if I'm, which of us is more tired. I'm worn out. Um, this is a slide that looks almost really familiar. You've seen it a number of times. What I did was I added in ventral root this time. Why? Well, because the, the final common pathway, the alpha motor neuron, they, they go through the ventral root. So if you had only a ventral root damage, which could be again by a, you know, a spinal laminectomy or a fusion that we talked about, uh, accident uh, that occurs during the surgery, 
um, you just get a motorcycle. What kind? Flaccidity of a certain group of muscles that be, would not be in the dermatome, but in the near vicinity of the dermatome that's involved. So if you think what muscle, you can actually look it up. What does T6 innervate in terms of muscles? It'd be a certain list of a half a dozen or something like that. Um, so that one is new. I think these are all uh, the same. Right side of the cerebellum, I added that in. Right side of the basal ganglia, I added that in. And then I did, uh, I think this one down here said just the right post-central gyrus in the facial region and the upper body region, I put in pre-central to capture that motor part. So what I'm gonna ask you to do to the extent that you can, you don't have to come in with prepared answers. I'm not gonna collect them or anything like that. But you can think about them and work on them all you want, as much as you want in any way that you want. What we're gonna do when we come in is answer any questions that you have on any of those slides, number one. Number two, we're gonna just tell everybody to break into small groups of two or three and uh, solve the first of these, what is it? eight or nine different problems. So what does it mean to solve? List the signs and symptoms, the specific signs and symptoms that you would expect to occur uh, with this one. And then we'll come back together and we will uh, troubleshoot as needed. Then we'll go to number two. And that's, uh, pardon me, I didn't mean to do that. And that's, that's how we will go about our class next time. And then I will throw additional ones. These are kind of simple in one sense, they're all right. How about if I just throw you a left and how about if it's not T6? But the principles would be the same. Um, the principles would be the same. So we are done. Uh, next week, I will do the same thing for this uh, cranial nerves. So you already know quite a bit about the cranial nerves, but we will tick through them one by one uh, with emphasis just on the speech producing ones. Uh, I think we've probably done enough with three, four, and six, for example, and with one and two, for example, one we're not dealing with at all. Two, I gave you the optic pathway last, the visual pathway uh, last week we went through it, but we'll, we'll keep integrating those things. So at some point then I'm gonna ask you to, you know, talk about the visual, uh, the visual signs in addition to everything else. Uh, that's it. And I will see you next Tuesday uh, and have a wonderful, have a wonderful weekend or week or whenever it is you catch this video.